My belief is your best marketing tool is referrals and social media is probably our biggest friend. I ask a lot of clients, oh, how did you find us? And if it isn't a referral, they say, oh, Instagram. And I saw reviews or I went on to Google and I saw reviews and I was like, okay, let me try them out. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Hey, hey guys, welcome, welcome back to the show. Welcome to February. I hope this new month is going well for you guys. I know January was long. I don't know about how you felt about January, but for me, January was long as ever. I felt like I hibernated for most of the month. I did not go outside. If I could help it, it was cold as hell. And I'm praying that it warms up. February is my birthday month, and I'm praying it warms up by the end of the month for my birthday. Anywho, I want to thank you guys. Actually, before we get into today's episode, I want to thank you for your response for last week's episode all about should you start a podcast. Now, when I recorded the show, I was not sure how many people in the Side Hustle Pro audience actually want to start a podcast, but I thought, let me go ahead and share this with everybody because I get so many questions. So, you know, for those who are too shy to send me a question, perhaps, let me just go ahead and drop some knowledge and remind you that I have all these free resources for you, right? So I am so glad I took the chance and did that because your response has been overwhelming. And I want to read just a couple of the notes I got via direct message. Um, You can always reach me at Side Hustle Pro on Instagram via DM. I might take a little bit to get to it, but shout out to you guys who reach out to me that way. So someone wrote, you know, my goodness, your podcast about how to start a podcast was everything and so inspiring. She said that she has actually been fearful. She's just been wanting, crafting, and planning, but talking herself out of starting a podcast. See, this is what we do, right? I I did the same thing. And that's why I wanted to get on here and remind you guys that it's actually normal. If you are talking yourself out of doing something, that fear is normal. So (laughs) do not run away from something that you want to do just because you are fearful of it. Just remind yourself that, that all of that is normal. And so now she says that As a result of the episode, it's reframed for her how to think of her podcast as a why not do it rather than a I'm not going to do it. So do it even if no one listens. That approach, that seemed to really resonate and hit home with her. And the reason I'm not reading the whole thing is kind of to preserve the privacy uh, because she did share a little bit about her podcast topic. But I just wanted to share for those of you who might have had the same experience, that particular note about reframing this podcast as a why not, right? What do you have to lose? You have nothing to lose and you have everything to gain. So it's February 2019. And if you have not already started working on that thing that you're scared of, I encourage you to do that. Okay. You have literally nothing to lose. No day is promised. So go ahead work on that idea. And if you're listening to this episode, you are just in time for my next live class. So you can catch me live and ask me all the questions you have about podcasting. So head over to sidehustlepro.co slash live class. I do not do these classes all the time. So get in where you fit in, okay? Sidehustlepro.co slash live class. So you can learn how to grow your first 1,000 downloads and how to work with me and get coaching from me directly to launch and scale your own podcast. All right. So now let's get into the episode. Boom, boom, boom. All right. So today in the guest chair, we have Yanae Damtu, an independent hairstylist based in Washington, D.C. She is a boss woman entrepreneur who owns her own salon, mentors other salon business owners, and is the full-time hairstylist for Michelle Obama. As you'll hear in this episode, Yene, who is an Ethiopian-American, California native, launched her career following cosmetology school, and within six months, she packed her bags and moved to Washington, D.C. to become one of two personal hairstylists for the Obama family. Even while working with such high-profile clientele, in 2015, Yene actually went back to school and earned her Bachelor's of Business Administration from Marymount University. Today, she combines that business knowledge with her stylist skill to own and manage her own salon, Aesthetic Salon, in Arlington, VA. 
Her work has garnered the attention of celebrity clientele, including actress Tracy Ellis Ross and actor Hugh Jackman and more. And in addition to owning and operating her salon, she also consults with a number of budding entrepreneurs on developing and executing improved operational procedures to achieve their own business objectives. Yune has such an interesting story. Let's get right into it. So welcome to the guest chair, Yune. Hi. Thank you for being here today. So I always like to know who is Yane? Give us a little peek into your life. When did you become interested in hair and being a stylist? Um, so I probably first peaked interest in this industry back when I was in middle school. Um, I remember growing up as a kid and my mom always putting hot rollers in her hair <laughs> on Sundays before we went to church. And then she would put a shower cap on and get in the shower. And when she came out, she had these full bouncy curls. And I never really understood the science or like how it all worked. Um, now as a professional, I understand how it works, but back then it was just kind of like, Oh, what is this? So I think that's what first, you know, piqued my interest. And then, um, that transitioned into playing with color and braiding hair. So I first began, uh, braiding everybody's hair in the neighborhood. And then it kind of just picked up from there. And then I was like, all right, I think I like this. I think that this is fun. Um, So by the time I was 16, I decided to go to cosmetology school and kind of the rest was history. And here here we are today. All right. So you grew up in the D.C. area, right? And how did no, you didn't? Oh, where'd you grow up? Oh, Oh, in L.A. That's right. In California. California native. I grew up in Orange County. California native in the house. So when you were in California, like how did that how did your surroundings help you to develop that skill and nurture this interest in hair? Um, you know, I think California is a very liberal place. And, and like I said, I was very fortunate because my high school offered a regional occupational program. So I was able to go to cosmetology school while I was in high school, which was really, really nice. So by the time I graduated, I was halfway done with the program and I went straight into working with, into a salon and assisting someone. So it, there was a space that was created that I was able to nurture and cultivate my craft and, and really hone in on it and figure out if this was really something that I wanted to pursue long term. Um, so for me, it was just it wasn't just that there was a program available, but there was also, you know, people in the neighborhood that were supportive, that believed in me, that came to me for services that allowed me to perfect my craft and for them to be my guinea pigs. Um, my, num- <laughs> my number one guinea pig is my brother. Um, when, it, <laughs> when it came to reading, I, w- I just would like be like, all right, let's try this on your head. And then halfway through, I'd be like, all right, I'm done. And he's just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> my hair. You can't just braid what you want and leave. Yeah, you can't just try um, out a few braids. <laughs> you know, and then my cousins, they, you know, they would all let me. I was thinking like last week, I was thinking about one of my really closest friends. Mm-hmm. She let me color her hair blonde, red, and black. What? These it people really three, love you. <laughs> three different chunks. And I think back and I'm like, God, that was so crazy. You know, like when that I think back to like in high school and you're letting me color your hair. And I'm like, I'm not like, not burgundy red, but like right. bright red and blonde. Wow. blonde. And was that your, your younger brother? Was it like, okay, I have to do this because my big sis or... <laughs> no, he was my older brother. Oh, that's nice. Because my older siblings don't let me, would have never. So shout out to him. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now, speaking of nurture, how did your parents feel? And, and, you know, how did that impact your pursuit of cosmetology? Were they supportive or were they kind of like, hey, you know, this is nice, but can you follow a more traditional path? It was a combination of both. You know, um, they agreed to go, they agreed to pay for me to go to cosmetology school when I was in high school. But it was with the understanding that I was still going to go to college. So they were like, yeah, sure. You could, you know, we'll pay for you, but you still have to go to college and you still have to make sure that you go the more traditional route. Like you could do hair in your dorm room, like for side money. Okay. But it wasn't like, yeah, you're going to just be a hairstylist. Um, But it was interesting because at the same time they built me a little makeshift salon in the, in the garage And there was a little sink and then they they got this little stand for me and my mom put a tile. It was plastic. I still in the house and she put like this big tile lock on top for my stove and all my heat styling. So it was one of those like, 
we're going to support it. We're not going to, we're not going to knock you, but at the same time, we're going to tell you what, you know, we want you to get an education still. Interesting. That's so great that they built that little salon. But how does cosmetology school work? So how is it that they expected you to do both? Is it like you did this for a year and they expected you to then go back to college? Well, cosmetology school, um, it is a program that you have to complete a certain amount of hours and you have to do both practical and technical studying. Okay. And um, every state is different. And in California, it's 1600 hours. So I was going while I was in high school. So I would go from 7.45 or 7 a.m. until 11.30. I was in traditional high school. And then from 5.30 to 10.30 at night, I was in cosmetology school. So if I completed the program in one, like I was supposed to, then I would have been done with my cosmetology school by the time I graduated high school. Well, instead, I went for a year, my junior year of high school. And when I got became a senior, I was like, okay, I need to do the traditional educational route and start preparing extracurricular activities and being more involved so I could go to college and get a scholarship. So I dropped out of cosmetology school halfway through the program. Okay. Uh, Went the traditional educational route, finished my associates at a local community college, get, uh, began to transfer to a university and was like, I'm going to just go to cosmetology school and finish it out. Cause the whole time I was assisting in a hair salon, at what stage did you start assisting in the hair salon? Was that as soon as you started cosmetology school? No, 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 no. It was, so I started cosmetology school when I was 16 and I started assisting in a salon when I, like, right when I graduated. So after a okay. year. So the two years that I was getting my associates, I was working in a salon. I was assisting, uh, who I call my very first mentor. I was assisting a woman by the name of Eve and she's the one who really took me in and kind of like showed me what it was like to work as a booth rented stylist. And, and, and back in those days, it was like in the early 2000s. So braids and cornrows were very popular. So I was able to assist her with braiding or braiding some of the clients that came in for her back then. A lot of men were getting their hair braided as well. So it helped me continue to perfect my craft and, and not to kind of leave what salon life was like. Right. Right. Um, so then after that, I decided to go back. I finished the program December of 2008. And that's when I became a licensed cosmetologist. So what happened next? At what stage did you start assisting celebrity hairstylist Johnny Wright? So that happened in August of 2008. It was right before I graduated cosmetology school. And I was looking for a mentor. And my brother told me he met this man who works at Frederick Fakai. And he was just like, you know, I'll connect you. And I was like, yes, please connect me. I want to see what it's like to be a person of color working at such a prestige salon in Beverly Hills. I was just very much intrigued. So we met and we, you know, kind of that started, that was the start of the beginning. Um, And that was in August. And I started working with him in September. He sent me on a job with a colleague of his, Larry Sims. Um, And I think it was one of those things where he was like, I'm going to go have you work with Larry and Larry who used to work with Johnny as well. will let me know if you are up to par where you need to be. And and Larry loved me. Okay. (laughs) And then it kind of just went from there. So then Johnny started calling me more often. Now, this seems like such a pivotal point that I want to unpack it a little bit because I'm curious to know, you you said you had a mentor, great mentorship in, in Eve and, you know, you were still so young. So to identify at that point that, hey, I think I want to find another mentor. What led you to that conclusion? Well, I'll be very honest. While I was in cosmetology school, my professor, her name was Jeannie Johnson. We called her JJ. And she had this program that she made us do salon visitation. And we would have to go to different salons and figure out their apprentice program was and kind of talk to a seasoned veteran in the industry. And so in that process is when I went, I was like, I'm going to go to Beverly Hills. I'm going to go, you know, to where you don't see a lot of African-American um, stylist working. And mm-hmm. so I was like, I'm going to go to one of those salons and I'm going to be the token and I'm going to figure out how it is to work there. And in that process is when my brother met Johnny and he was just like, oh, well, let me introduce you to Johnny. And I was like, oh, okay. So it just kind of just, things just kind of started to fall into place. And one thing led to the next. Um, and, we, and, and, and now I'm where I am today. Okay. So you seem to always be trying to navigate this balance of, uh, 
pursuing a more traditional path while holding on to what you knew was your passion, hair. How did you see that playing out in the future? Did you see something that see it as like, oh, okay, hair will be my side hustle? Or were you really just like doing this for your parents and then like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go do hair. <laughs> um, So it's interesting. So I knew that, so I have the personality of when I start something, I'm, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to see it through. Got it. So that was kind of what the anchor of why I went back to get my bachelor's. And I ended up getting going back um, in 2013. I went back to Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia, and went full time and ended up getting my bachelor's there, graduating in 2015. So that was a pivotal moment in my career because I was juggling what I knew that I loved, which was hair. And I was working in the industry that I loved, but I also knew that the skill set and what I was learning in school would eventually benefit me. At the moment, I was just kind of like, I'm just going to get this degree so my parents will leave me alone because I promise <laughs> I get a degree. I was like, oh, I'll go back. I'll go out, go back. It's just a temporary dropping out, finishing cosmetology school, and then I'll go back and finish getting my bachelor. But what ended up happening was I finished cosmetology school in December, got my license in January, and moved to D.C. in April. So there really wasn't no time for me to go back. I ended up dropping out and I was enrolled, but I was just like this, something in my spirit just told me mm, withdraw from, withdraw from these classes before it gets to a place where you're going to have to pay for classes that you're not going to take. Mm. Um, so that was probably the moment that I was just kind of like, all right, this is, this is where I'm, I'm stepping out on faith and I'm going to do what I want to do and pursue my dream. And eventually I knew that I would go back and get a degree and I did, but it was when it felt fitting and, and it, the timing felt right to me. And I feel like when I went back to school to get my bachelor's, it was the perfect time. Um, I was 24, 25, I think I was 25. And it was perfect because going back to school as an adult, your approach is completely different. And I was on campus as well as taking like one or two online classes, but being in a classroom with, with, your colleagues and your, your classmates being significantly younger than me, it was always interesting with the approach that I took versus the approach that they took um, and what we were learning versus having work experience and real life experience. But yes. I, like it, it kept me ahead and it, it gave me a different outlook. And I appreciated the what I was learning a lot more because I could apply it in everyday life. I can see that because, you know, I often feel like if I was to do college over Knowing what I know now, all of us would approach it differently, right? We would take different classes. We would, we know what skills we need. So I'm sure that was such a benefit coming back with that lens. Absolutely. Now, what really resonates with me about your story and just what stands out to me is that this, this drive within, and at such a young age too, I'm still just amazed. This drive of being able to follow this passion in your gut, even if you didn't know how it was all going to play out. And I just want to know a little bit more about, okay, what is it about hairstyling and what had you seen and been exposed to that made you know, this is a viable career path and I know one day I'll be able to do X and that's what I want to do. I think for me it was, you know, being exposed and being, having access to being in a salon at a young age. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, by the time I graduated high school, I went straight into assisting someone in a salon. So seeing that I was just kind of like, oh, okay, well, I could actually do something. I could actually turn this into a, a sustainable career and I could be an entrepreneur and cut my, you know, having been raised in an entrepreneurial household, I think it was natural and it made it easy for me to make that transition to kind of be like, okay, I do want to be my own boss. I never thought that I wanted to own my own salon, but I knew that I could be a booth renter and rent a chair in a salon and kind of make my own hours and just pay my monthly um, you know, rental rate and, and do what I needed to do, take a vacation when I needed to take a, take a vacation, do whatever it is that I had to do. So I think that was the, the moment for me that I was just kind of like, okay, I know that this is what I want, but to what extent and how far it would take me, I had no idea. Within your entrepreneurial home, um, who was an entrepreneur and how did that influence, you know, how you thought about entrepreneurship? Like it obviously, it seems like it was a good experience, a good observation of what entrepreneurship is. I think both of my parents instilled, you know, entrepreneurial spirit in me. They had, but my parents owned a meat market and a kite store 
when we were kids. And I remember going and like spending the, when we were younger, going and spending the day there, or if we were sick, just going with my parents to work or my dad then opened his own delivery company. And I remember when we had days off from school, we would go with my dad to do his deliveries and sit in the front seat. And we would, you know, he was driving all throughout California. So it, it would be road trips for us sometimes. And it was fun and kind of just seeing how he interacted with people. So I think that as we continue to get older, our dad showed us ways for us to save money, for us to, you know, I still file paper like my dad did. He had a file cabinet. I remember there was a key and it was in the garage and we just have to <laughs> take things and put it in. And he had this briefcase where the bills were and when he paid a check, he wrote the check number on it and, you know, filed it away for record keeping. All things that I started to do. And everyone's like, really? In the digital world and digital space now, you don't have to keep things. You can move things electronic. And I'm like, nope, I still like to write checks. <laughs> I still like to, you know, it's just, I, I think it's because I grew up seeing my yeah. dad do it. I was like, that's what grownups do. Yeah. That it just kind of resonated with me. That's so interesting. Um, I just forced myself to order a checkbook the other day. So I'm, I'm getting back into that whole thing. But that's so cool. Now, you graduated with your cosmetology degree and you moved to D.C. What brought you to D.C. at this point? Was this the stage where you were starting to work with Michelle Obama and her team? Yes. So I relocated here um, April 7th, 2009. Um, and that was after Johnny offered me a full time position to assist him. And my primary responsibility was to be in charge of um, the girls and Mrs. Robinson and be support to Mrs. Obama and figuring out how I could support Johnny while supporting her. And what were those early days like as you were still developing your craft, still young while working in such a prestigious office? It was an opportunity for me to continuously learn. Um, you know, being able to be on set of a photo shoot, learning what it's like to do hair and how it films on TV or in front of a screen or, or to learn what it's like to work with someone who's so visible. Um, that's nothing you learn in hair school. You know, no one's teaching you these techniques and these skill sets that you need to work with people of that caliber. So for me, it was, it was a learning process. It was an opportunity for me to grow, for me to really figure out who I wanted to be, what I wanted to be and how I wanted to do it. And how did, how did I want to achieve it? And it was the moment where I looked and I was just like, all right, I know that I enjoy working with people. And I, that's the moment I think where it shifted for me, where I realized doing hair isn't just a hobby, but it could be a lifelong career. Um, and that's when I really began to be like, this is what I wanted to do. And if I'm going to do it, I have to be the best at it. I have to, I have to know the latest trends. I have to ed, you know, go to continuing education. I needed to make sure that I was up with the times. And I think that DC really allowed me to practice that. I moved here when I was 21. I never had lived outside of California. I've never been outside of my parents' house. And then I decided to up and move across the country to somewhere cold where <laughs> it snowed. And, you know, it was a learning curve for me on so many levels. I was like, oh, do I need chains for my tires when it snows? And they're like, no, there's something called all, per all season tires. <laughs> And I was like, oh, OK, because I didn't understand how people were driving in the snow. on the road when it snowed and there weren't chains on their tires. So it was just a number of life lessons that mm -hmm. I learned when, you know, for me, I, because I didn't have a traditional college experience, I felt like moving to D.C. was that opportunity where I had to figure out who I was going to be as a human being in society and how I was going to participate in society and what that was going to look like. So with that, what kind of skills, what kind of things did you pursue while in D.C. when you weren't at work to continue to improve your skills? Were you working in a different salon or what kind of classes were you pursuing to continue to grow? Oh, I did so many things. I worked at a nonprofit for a little bit part time as an administrative assistant. And it was a nonprofit called the Gloucester Institute. They focused on helping, you know, senior high schools with etiquette or with how to fill out their college application. So it was really nice. Um, I worked there for right under a year. And then I worked at a you know small little hair salon in the back of a beauty supply store in a mall. And then from there, I relocated. When the mall closed, I relocated to a small boutique salon in Arlington that my aunt owned. And that was a different experience to work with family you know, and, and, and to work with family and to work with a different generation. Right. Mm. So it's like, she always looked at me as like her little cousins. I remember as her little niece. So when I 
first started, she was like, you need to be here 15 minutes on time. You need to do, you know, there was all of these rules. And I was just like, my work ethic is my work ethic and it's my name on the line. So all of these rules that you're trying to place on me to ensure that I don't give you a bad name or make the company look bad. I was like, you don't have to worry about. And then I worked there for maybe like six years. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I opened my own salon aesthetics in 2017. So what would you say you, you know, working as an administrative assistant or in different hair salons, different in the mall and the hair store, what kind of skills and, and what kind of lessons did you learn from those jobs versus working with Johnny and with the Obamas? Um, you know, they, all the skills that I learned, I think that because I was juggling so much at one time, um, everything kind of fit hand in hand. And there were lessons and things that I was learning working at the nonprofit that I was able to take um, with the opportunities that I had with the Obamas or other clients or working in a salon space or assisting Johnny, everything fit. Everything was like the stepping stone to the next place that I was trying to go. So being an administrative assistant, I was exposed to, you know, learning how to correspond properly with, uh, with new inquiries. Um, it was about scheduling and the importance of scheduling and creating a system and, and creating a briefing book for the principal agent at the nonprofit. So it was a number of different things. I was there to be, I basically was a support role, but the responsibilities that were given to me became greater and greater as they began to realize that I could juggle it all. So more than anything, I think all of that together helped set me up for the position that I'm in today, being a salon owner, being a traveling stylist, trying to be president in my own personal life, trying to be a good person in society and like participate in things that go on in the world around us and give back and do community service and everything that I want to do and yes. ask about what's next for me. I think that the years of juggling multiple jobs and playing multiple roles and wearing so many hats, it just set me up to do that now. And, and for me to figure out, everyone's like, how do you juggle? How do you, how do you maintain everything? Right. And I'm just, I don't know, a calendar. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if you plan and you schedule things yeah. out, anything is possible. Exactly. And isn't it amazing just how much you can have a talent and you can have a business, but that human interaction factor, those interpersonal skills that you develop when you are the first point of contact for an organization, it is priceless. You can't really, you know, put a number on how important it is to know how to welcome and orient your customers into that space so that they then want to come back. Can you speak a little bit to that and how you work to cultivate an overall experience? So it's not just about hair. It's about people want the Yene experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something that I keep talking about a lot um, right, more recently with people is that, you know, it's not when I opened up aesthetics, it wasn't about oh, I'm just opening up another salon. I wanted it to be a different experience than what you were used to. So I was sure to study the other salons that were in the area and finding what they lacked and trying to fulfill that void. And it was about an experience. And I think that as you think about um, the way that things are moving in the direction that consumers are buying, it's not just about, Ooh, do I like the product? It's about how does this make me feel? What's the experience like? Is it like any other place that I've gone to? And that's something that I really worked very hard in making sure that not just myself, but my colleagues and my salon team as a whole that we work on. Um, that when you come in, it's not just you're coming in. It's not just a transaction of mm -hmm. you know, coming us, providing you a service, are you paying us and you leave. But it's like, how was your day today? Yes. Oh, last time we saw you, you were doing this. And people are always just like, wow, you remember and I'm just like, yes, because for the for the next hour, hour and a half, you are going to have my undivided attention. Mm -hmm. And it's important for me to give you that. And it not and, and by giving you your undiv my undivided attention, I'm able then to create an experience and a feeling is then created and associated with it. And that's what leads to long term customers. I want to get back to aesthetics. But before we do, I do want to know. At what stage did that whole transition happen? Because for a long time, you know, hairstyling seemed to have been your side hustle, right? You're assisting Johnny, you're working in the White House, and then you moved into full-time styling, right? You went from side hustle to full-time styling for Mrs. Obama. Talk us through that process. Um, You know, 
I, you know, I, I want to say that it was just like from full time to part time, but I guess because I look at them as a family unit, I was always around. And but you I couldn't was, sustain yourself just kind of like being on call. Is that how it felt? Or no, I could, I could, but it was. I, I think that I like to stay busy, so <laughs> it wasn't enough work for me to say, this is all that I'm going to do. Okay. And it's like, if I could sit here and I could still service another client, why not? And I think it's because I enjoy the interactions with that you have. It's a very intimate space. So I enjoy that part of the industry more than anything. And being that I enjoy that part, I was always, always juggling multiple things and I was always wanting to do more. And at what stage did you decide, okay, I'm going to develop my own salon now? I, that was... 2016. I don't know. I just had aha moment. You know, I was beginning to get a little more publicity and people coming to me more and people saying, Oh, you know, one thing I love about coming here is, you know, it's, it's, I'm in and out. I'm not here all day. My appointment starts within five to 10 minutes of my appointment time. So all of the, the things that other salons were lacking, some of the things that other salons were lacking, I was filling that void and I became a little more recognized, I guess, in the, in the district. And so Mm -hmm. I was just kind of like, okay, I have it. Why not? Like I'm able to, why not? Why Why not? And so I did. And what was the process like of, you know, finding a location, renting real estate, doing all of that? Was that intimidating? How did you go about it? Oh God, that process. Um, (laughs) Yes, It was a lot. Um, I was fortunate, you know, I'm very fortunate because I have all types of women that sit in my chair and my clients have been my number one support system and my backbone in this process. Not only have they followed me from salon to salon and where I've bounced around, but they have been my legal advice. They have been my, um, they have been my bankers. They have been my loan officers. They have been my, you know, business help, you know, investment help, you know, helpers in the sense that if I've had a question, they'd be like, I don't do this, but let me connect you with this person. So A client of mine referred me to a commercial real estate agent, and I was very specific about the area that I wanted to open my salon in. And so I sent him to check on an area and the space that I wanted wasn't available, but they had a space three doors down. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, he was just like, hey, that one's not available, but this is available. And I was like, okay. Um, I was lucky that you know, I had a bunch of friends who were trying to do different things and open up their own businesses. So um, the young ladies who did the decor, Masa Design, they're girlfriends of mine. I was one of their first projects. Um, House of Design was a team that did all my project management and construction. Um, Really good friends of mine, all small business owners, all people that I've known for a couple of years, all, you know, in their early 30s or late 20s. So I really relied on my community and my friends and I looked within to figure out, all right, who can I help and who can I give an opportunity to be like, here's an opportunity for you to showcase your skill set as well. Instead of me giving the money to somebody else, I'd rather hire somebody from within, somebody that I knew. That's Um, smart. So, and and for me, it was just kind of like, it gave me a level of comfort um, because it was like, these are my friends. These are my people. They're going to take care of me and they're going to, treat it like their own, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was really nice and helpful. So it made the process a lot easier, you know, and asking for help, you know, I did not sleep. I Googled everything Mm -hmm. and I asked for help to people that were subject matter experts in that field. I was fortunate. My uncle is an architect, so he did all my architectural drawings. Um, He referred um, all of the engineers and the drafters that did everything for me. So it was really about just opening up and being vulnerable and asking for help and saying, I don't know this, but you do. Can you help me? And if you can't, can you tell me someone that can? Yes. And, And so many people were willing to help more than I thought. It was overwhelming. Wow. And, you know, I think that's just a perfect example and reminder of closed mouths don't get fed. And you kind of, instead of keeping all your like fears and worries and questions to yourself, if you just start to put it out there and be open and say, hey, I'm trying to figure out this, you know, even if you know that person doesn't have the answer, you never know who they can connect you to. So that's an important reminder for all of us. Absolutely. Hey guys, it's Nikayla here with a quick word from our sponsors. If you are side hustling, 
I know that you need to constantly learn new skills to do things like put up your own website, market your business, and so much more. That's why I keep Skillshare in my business arsenal. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators. There are over 25,000 classes in subjects like Photoshop, accounting, copywriting, and even podcasting. That's right. I recently published the How to Start Your Own Podcast, Podcasting for Beginners course on Skillshare. So now you can learn all of my podcasting secrets over on Skillshare. Whether you're looking to start a podcast, though, or just grow your side hustle or gain new professional skills, Skillshare is there to keep you learning, thriving, and reaching these new year goals. I, for one, have a course on copywriting next up in my Save Skillshare classes. And now Skillshare has a special New Year offer just for Side Hustle Pro listeners. Get two months of unlimited access to over 25,000 classes for free. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash Nikayla. That's N-I-C-A-I-L-A. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash Nikayla to start your two months now. One more time, that's Skillshare.com slash Nikayla, N-I-C-A-I-L-A. I remember when I first turned my side hustle into a business. It was no easy feat. It took a lot of commitment, working before and after work, and even on my lunch break. Bottom line, I always had something to do. So why not make things a little easier? Well, our friends at FreshBooks have the solution. FreshBooks invoicing and accounting software is designed specifically for small business owners. It's simple, intuitive, and keeps you way more organized than having your own little Excel spreadsheet or checking your bank account every minute. FreshBooks lets you create and send professional looking invoices in 30 seconds and then get paid two times faster with automated online payments. Plus, file expenses even quicker and keep them perfectly organized for tax time. And the best part, FreshBooks grows alongside your business. So you'll always have the tools you need when you need them without ever having to learn accounting. Try it free for 30 days, no catch and no credit card required. Go to freshbooks.com slash side hustle pro and enter side hustle pro in the how did you hear about a section to get started. And were you financing all of this yourself? If so, did you have to take out a loan or was this, um, did you use any programs to get help in the investment part? Um, I did it all by myself. I did take a loan. I did an SBA guaranteed loan. So that was one of the programs that I looked into. I looked into a lot of different programs that they offered um, for minority business owners, women business owners, um, you know, different grants. And I knew what I wanted. And so I slowly purchased things. So I set goals for myself every month and was like, all right, this week, this much is going to go aside and it's going to pay for this. Um, and I, I did take a business loan for the construction um, because I did have to do a complete build out. But aside from that, I paid for everything else on my own. Oh, okay. And what, what was the biggest roadblock? I know this sounds so smooth right now, but you know, what was a moment where you felt Permitting. like quit? <laughs> what? what was that? Permitting. Oh, tell us, tell us more. Permitting was something that I just, it never made. I was I was like, I don't understand why I have to go through all of these steps to get permits. Permitting was a challenge. Um, creating a design and staying with it. You know, colors, picking out colors was a, another thing. It was just like, I, I made the, my contractors change the wallpaper in my bathroom three times. <laughs> Not because of anything else of the fact that once it was up, I was like, I don't like it. <laughs> um, but there were certain things like the chairs, the yeah. chairs the tile, it was like, well, this is it. You can't change it. Okay. So love it or, or love it or hate it. It is what it is. And what kind of uh, permits do you need? Like for what? Oh, plumbing permits, electrical permits, building permits. Um, and then, you know, after that, it's the inspection. And then after that, it's getting, you know, certificate of occupancy and then making sure that you are, you have the certificate for business tax to operate as a business and then going to the uh, state board um, to making sure that you have a salon business license in addition to a cosmetology license, in addition to a salon manager license. Ooh. So it was a number of things that I was just kind of like, oh, didn't know I needed that. Making sure that I had, you know, the proper liability insurance for my business. It was interesting because one of the things that I needed to have was they required me to have a certain amount of auto insurance. And I guess it's because of where the salon is 
place and how close it is to, to the street front is what I'm assuming. But there was all of these, you know, things that I was just kind of like, oh, you know, an umbrella policy it was so many things. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. I would never have expected that. And I know you now kind of sometimes counsel other entrepreneurs. Do you have like a, a like, you need like a deep dive session on like, listen, if you want to open a salon, you need to know all of this. Yes. So I am actually getting ready to launch, hoping to launch in July, um, my next venture called the Beautypreneur School, where I am basically um, going to be helping budding stylists correctly set up their business and and using my degree and my skill set and um, my background with being a salon owner and kind of merging them all together because there's so many great stylists. And as creatives, we're not always aware of how to handle the business side. Yes. Um, so are we protected? How is our business set up? Are we an LLC? Are we, you know, independent contractors? So how, what are you, how are you paying your taxes? And people think, oh, I'm, you know, I like to be cash and carry. And I'm like, that's great until you want to buy a house or buy a car and you don't have any credit set up. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the impression a lot of people have like, oh, that's so great to work. You know, as a salon owner, you don't have to, you can just get so much cash. You don't have to report it all. And that's not really <laughs> the case. You or can, even, but it's limited. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Put yourself, you pigeonhole yourself into a place where it's like, I, you could afford a mortgage of $3,000 a month. I'm sure you can. Mm-hmm. On paper, you can't because you're not paying taxes on it. So yep. they don't know that that's how much you're generating. Yep. Um, and you can't go buy a car. You want to go buy this new, not nice, expensive car, but you can't because you don't have credit set up. Mm-hmm. So now we're getting into the real. <laughs> get finance yep. for a business loan. Mm-hmm. And you don't have the capital to spend $150,000 to build a salon or buy a salon. You know, you don't, have all of the capital to take everything out of your savings. So, you know, for me, it's about understanding that and making sure that the next generation of stylists not only is cultivating and practicing how to be better with their craft and what the service, but, you know, the experience, creating experiences, because we are all about experiences. It's not just about, can I get, can you do hair? Yes. But do you do hair with a good attitude, with a smile on your face? Are you kind? Are you caring? Or are you the type of stylist that just like, I'm going to be on the phone the whole entire time while a client's in my chair? And they, mm. are they are your clients just transactional? Exactly. And speaking of capital and all of this now, with everything that you just said about permits, I'm thinking about the fact that a lot of people lose money in the first year of business. Like you're just trying to break even, recoup what you spent to set up your salon. So what has been your experience? Now you're what, two years in? Yeah. Okay. Two years opened in June. You know, more than anything, it's about finding a location and setting realistic expectations. And it's all about budgeting. For me, I found a salon location that, you know, I wish I had a a larger salon, but I wasn't going to take a larger investment if I didn't know. Um, I needed to still get my feet wet. So um, um, don't bite more than you could swallow essentially is kind of was my philosophy and making sure that you have a good CPA that helps you if you can't manage everything everything on your own um, and making sure that you are using a booking software that helps you as well track what you're doing. Because I'll be honest, prior to being a salon owner, I can't tell you how much I was making from the salon. You know, I, I didn't have, I can't say like, oh, well, this is what I'm generating monthly. But now I see all the numbers, you know, I see all the numbers and I'm fully aware of what is going on with my business. Um, and that is, by not just by the grace of God, but by the help of, you know, hiring professionals that do that stuff to making sure that I'm not late on payments to make sure that, you know, I am setting myself up for long-term goals of, of purchasing a house and being a homeowner or expanding the salon space or whatever. So I just think it's very important to make sure that you do that as well. I think that's a good point as well, because, you know, sometimes we think of success with a business as just on the money front. But it sounds to me like, you know, you came in with a goal of first getting everything set up and in place. And so what will success look like for you for Aesthetic Salon? Um, we're in the process of expanding um, and we're also in the process of being um, an educational salon and trying to change the stereotype of what salons are in our community and making sure that it's a space that we are cultivating the next generation of stylists. So, you know, we're looking to, um, as we look to expand, I'm looking to find a place that will allow me to not only 
bring on more stylists and to service more clients, but also train the next generation of stylists as well. You mentioned you use an awesome booking software now. Can you share what that is and how it helps? I currently am using Rosie. Um, why it helps is because it has good record keeping, but you know, what I have found, um, this is like the third booking software that I've switched to, um, in a matter of two, uh, a year and a half. I, there is always something lacking for me, you know, and a lot of people use popular softwares like style seat, which are all great and have a lot of the functions that we want. But, you know, I think that being a hairstylist, it is such it, a woman is allowing you into such an intimate and personal space and, and, and allowing you into a place of vulnerability when she gives you the hands of her hair. Mm-hmm. So for me, you know, the idea of using a booking software system, like online booking, it's convenient, but I feel like it takes away from that personal experience. So we personally do not offer online booking at aesthetics. Um, we have a scheduler that we, work with who handles all of the bookings and it's via email. So she's able to answer all of your questions. Everything's in writing. So it's very clear. There isn't really a lot of room for confusion. Um, so we're looking, I'm actually looking to have a software built on my own um, to, to kind of be tailored to stylists like myself who don't want online booking, who still want to have control over the overall schedule but want the, the ability to do the good record keeping and and run reports and, and figure out, you know, sales and numbers and all those other things and get online text message confirmation. And um, I'm sorry, online, not online, email uh, and text confirmation and reminders and, you know, create a profile and mass marketing campaigns. All of that stuff is the software that I currently have. It does, but there are some things that I wish it still did that I, th- that I think for my business that if they're modified would be extremely beneficial. Oh, that's interesting because uh, with everything being so digital now, so do do your customers ever ask for online booking? And if so, how do you deal with that? Mm, Sometimes they do, but I think that everyone generally feels that our system is very, you know, useful Um, and it's user friendly because we have somebody monitoring the emails for 12 hours a day aside from on Sundays. And so that allows people to answer all of your questions. Last week we had people call and they, you know, new clients and they were like, wow, you know, you guys were so helpful. I didn't feel like I was rushed. It's great to be able to talk to you because I don't necessarily know what I want done to my hair. And I kind of wanted someone to walk me through it mm-hmm. and kind of figuring out what service is right for me. And I think that online booking, you could give a description, but there's so much nuance to it. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And we're, it's not like a cookie cutter situation where exactly. it's like, everyone's hair that gets their hair washed and blow dried is going to take the same amount of time. And the other reason why we really stay away from online booking is because we don't double book. So your appointment time is your appointment time. And if you, if you open up your books to online booking, unless you could customize which Rosie allows us to customize with this stylist, it takes this client this much time, but with this other stylist, it takes like, you know, it could take, you, I could take me to do your hair one hour, but it could take my partner stylist 45 minutes and it's able to, to log and customize that. So when I'm booking an appointment with me, it'll show all the one hour blocks. But when I'm book, when you're booking an appointment with her, you'll see all the 45 minute blocks. Uh, you know? Okay. Now that's definitely an opportunity to develop something much better. Yeah. And, you know, just speaking from personal experience as, you know, when I'm going to book something, a lot of times stylists will have like, you know, blowout and haircut and they mean, you know, trim or whatever. But I'm, that always intimidates me. I'm like, I, I just as soon as I get in the chair, I'm like, I just want to trim, not a cut, guys. <laughs> Let's be very clear. So yeah. I think it's really it will be great to have things be as specific as possible. Now, before we jump into the lightning round, I do want to talk a bit about marketing and attracting clients. So you definitely built up a name for yourself and had that brand in opening the salon. But were there any other strategic steps you took to market and continue to grow the aesthetic clientele? So uh, my belief is your best marketing tool is referrals. Um, we do not advertise that much. in the, we don't ad- we, There's no paid advertising that we do. Um, and social media is probably our biggest friend. Um, we post, um, on, I post a lot on my personal Instagram 
and use hashtags. And I ask a lot of clients, oh, how did you find us? And if it isn't a referral, they say, oh, Instagram. Yep. You know, search <laughs> hashtag and I found you guys. And then I went on to Yelp and I saw reviews. Or I went on to Google and I saw reviews. And then I was like, okay, let me try them out. Mm-hmm. Um, so that has probably been our greatest tool. And, you know, I tell people being authentic, authenticity is, is, is something that you have as a business owner that you have to understand. And for me, I think why I choose not to market is because I don't feel like we are the salon for every client. We are not the stylist for every client and not every client is for us. And so we are targeting a very specific demographics. And I think the best way for them to find us is through referrals. That is a very good point to know. Not every client is your client. But speaking of that, do you find that your brand intimidates people at times? Like, oh, you know, maybe I can't afford her or maybe, you know, that's not for me. It's only for celebrities. Have you ever dealt with that? Absolutely. We've dealt with that. And I think that's one of the reasons why we try to be very transparent. And on our salon, all of our pricing is listed. Mm. Um, People, there's a lot of people who are like, oh my God, I didn't think I could afford you. And I'm just (laughs) Our prices are pretty average. They're pretty standard prices for the area. So we tell people all the time, everything is on the website. You can figure out pricing. If you have questions, we could let you know in advance. You could call us when it comes to color or extension services. Um, we could tell you a base range, um, but in, which is why we require a consultation because we will tell you everything. We don't like surprises. I don't want a client to get a service done. And then after we start, we go to check them out and they, they don't know what they're paying. Mm. They're a large bill. Like I want to tell you in advance what your service price is and you can make the decision on whether or not it's within, within, within your, your budget or not. Right. No surprises. No surprises. So, Yene, you talked about a lot of awesome things that you're working on, not only aesthetics, but also in potentially developing software and solving for pain points in the industry. What would you say is like next? What is on your horizon, immediate horizon for Yene? Um, the biggest projects that I'm trying to complete this year is the expansion of my salon space and launching my online educational program. Okay. All right. Well, we can't wait to look out for that. So now, yes. So we're going to jump into the lightning round so that we can find out a little bit more about you, how your brain works. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. All right. Number one, what is a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Asking for help, hands down. Number two, what's been the best business book that you've consumed this year? Um, so I haven't started it, but I just got Blitz Calling. Blitz Calling. Okay. And when do you feel most alive and why? Um, in the salon. Uh, there's a special interaction um, and there's this, it, there's a very, it's a personal space. I love being able to interact with different people and um, we believe in, uh, it's not just your one person's client at the salon, but it's like a little aesthetic sisterhood and family. Everyone kind of talks to everybody. So I like it because um, even on days that I'm feeling down, I could go into the salon and someone, something they'll tell you will change the way that you feel and it'll be a feel good moment for you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Number four, what's a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Um, put it on a schedule. And what's your favorite scheduling tool? Google Calendar. Finally, number five, what is your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing a steady paycheck? Do it. You have to step out on faith. No one is going to advocate for you more than yourself. No one is going to turn a dream into reality other than yourself. No one knows your drive. No one knows your hustle. No one knows your ambition. No one knows your passion. And only you could truly execute that. And if you're too scared to step out on faith, then you'll never know what it's like to be on the other side. Yes, I love it. Now, where can people connect with you and Aesthetic Salon after this interview? Um, you can follow us on Instagram. Aesthetics.salon is our salon page where you could see all of our lovely work. And you could always follow me. Follow me along on my journey as we get back to get back on the road and the book tour. I have some um, exciting travel plans for this year, which will be fun um, and getting into new business ventures. And I plan to post a lot of behind the scenes. So you can follow me um, at Yene Damtu on Instagram. All right. 
And with that, guys, there you have it. Thank you so much for being the guest chair. Thank you. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at side hustle pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the side hustle pro Facebook community. Go to side hustle forward slash mastermind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks guys. Talk to you next week.